Hello guys and welcome to our third session and joining our host group. Thank you for, for you guys that have been with us for the previous ones and for those of you joining us today for the first time, welcome. It's so lovely to see you. Thank you for being with us. And we're going to speak this uh, evening about something that is a pressing thing from uh, last year already and maybe you've read something of it. Uh, it's more for the families. So tonight I'm just going to adjust um, your session a little bit. So your session is different than some of the others that uh, they are watching in, in different host groups this evening. But I want to make it applicable to you guys. We are speaking about uh, just that, that question that came at the end of the last year where the um, education department wanted to do this comprehensive sexual education thing and, and thrust it into the schools. So uh, that is where the conversation started and we had a lovely time just uh, speaking about that. So this evening I want to, to speak to you guys, not necessarily on, on how you will have to speak to your kids about this. If you want that, then you're welcome to get the other session too, where I speak more to the families and uh, just speak to them in this, in how do you speak to your kids about that. But that is something that, uh, that you guys can just ask for if you want it. But tonight I want to speak to, to you guys about just sexual purity. You know, it's something that is, that is so difficult to come by these days. You know, if, if you speak to the average 20 year old or even less, you know, they will laugh in your face if you speak to them about sexual purity. And especially if you go to the, the place of, you know, abstinence and to marriage and those types of things, it's just unheard of these days. And it's weird that uh, it has come from a play, place um, where we had relative values in that where, you know, ultimately, I don't think there's any values in the world, obviously, left regarding this um, anymore. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to speak about it. Because this is an important thing. This is something that God has given. You know, this is something that we need to take seriously. And I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about my own life. Most of you might have just known, you know, and heard my story already. Um, I haven't been the, the, the squeaky clean pastor that I'm now. Um, that's just a joke. But, you know, I, I haven't been sexually pure, you know, when it comes to a lot of these things that we speak about. And, you know, hindsight's always a perfect science, right? You know, and somebody like me might have spoken to me on the other side and uh, I wouldn't have listened. But now I can listen and now I can speak because I've experienced the things that God says in his word. And that is something that I don't want you to go through. So anyway, so let's speak about sexual purity. So the thing that uh, that we, we read in Ephesians 5 verse 3, you know, what is the benchmark? What is God's benchmark, benchmark when it comes to sexual purity? Well, it's a tough one. But it's something that God can help you do. It says, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for holy people of God. OK, so so God's standard is massive. You know, so that is that is what he expects. And, and that's why marriage and all of those things are important, because in marriage, we find expression in a godly, holy place and way of our sexual desires. That's what God has given us in that. So let there not even be a hint of sexual impurity or, or immorality among you. Now, how does your life and my life look when it comes to that statement? Well, sometimes, yeah, not as that scripture says. So is it really possible? I mean, you might sit there, you might think, is it possible? Yes, it is possible. You know, I've been a student myself and uh, there was a time for about a year and a half where God has graced me, you know, for just following after him, having been diligent with my thoughts, being diligent with, with a lot of things regarding this. And even in a time where the onslaught is at its worst, I think, you know, for students and for, for people that's, that's studying um, in places. In that time, for a year and a half, God kept me in a place of not even a hint of sexual immorality until I became prideful and thought, yeah, I got this down. And then, uh, you know, that was stupid, but it is really possible. But there's there's some keys that I want to uh, want you guys to to have tonight. Um, 
Sexual purity goes against the flow of the world. So you will be weird for people if you go for sexual purity. I've got a, an, an analogy here, um, you know, that, that I read somewhere. Um, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, people don't crumble in a day. You don't fall, you fade. In your mind, there's that pride that says, I'd never do that. Okay, the world knows that. But you don't just do it. It's a slow series of compromises, little ones. The one goes into the one event, ultimately and eventually, until you are sitting in the place that you said, I will never do that. I will never go there. Doing something that you didn't really want to do. So, if you don't look at yourself and what you take into your body, your eyes and your ears and, and, and a lot of things, then you will slowly progress to a place of being in this state where you don't really want to be. You know, there's a thing when it comes to pornography, especially in pornography is a pervasive thing. You know, pornography is in such a way, you know, the, the wiring of your brain, and we'll speak about that just now. When you do pornography, it is exactly the same physiologically in your brain, you know, with all of the things that happens in your brain, it is exactly the same as a heroin, heroin addict. Same thing happens. Okay. So it is dangerous because it, it, it gives you that sense of pleasure and a lot of things that comes with that. So this analogy that I read is, uh, is about, you know, Christian people. And some of you might be even be like that, you know, so, you know, you're not supposed to do it. There's this king that says, listen, there's dragon eggs all around. If you find a dragon egg, bring the dragon egg to me and we will destroy it. But then this one guy goes out, he finds a dragon egg and it's beautiful and he, he just looks at it and it's mesmerizing to him. And then he decides, oh, I'm just going to keep it. So he doesn't take it back to the king. He keeps it and it, it, it starts to hatch and now he's got this little dragon. And it's cute, man. And it's nice and it's, he's playing with it. And then he goes out daily to play with this dragon. And he goes out and he plays and he comes back and he goes out and he plays and this dragon grows because he's feeding it, he's giving it his, all his sustenance and then they start to play and uh, this dragon gets bigger and bigger and then all of a sudden he, um, he comes to a place where he sees that because now that this dragon starts to fly and he gets on the dragon, he flies with the dragon, it's, a, it's amazing fun. But he saw that on his hands and on his legs there where he touches the dragon, you know, scales are coming, he's becoming like the dragon, you know, there's scales on his hands and his feet. And uh, he comes back and he, he continues to, to cover up, you know, he, he, he keeps all his boots, his boots on. And, and when he comes to the king, you know, he keeps all those things on. And, and then he um, thinks that nobody notices. And then he goes out one day and, uh, and they've been playing him and this dragon. They've been running and, you know, he's been beating the dragon all the time. But then one day the dragon starts to beat him. And then when the dragon beat him, then this dragon turns around and now this dragon focuses on him and wants to destroy him and all of a sudden he knows I've got no defense he's stronger than me I fed him I've done all these things and now I'm in trouble you know anyway so long story you can uh, um, I'm not gonna tell the rest but that is what it is like with pornography when you start to enjoy that when you start to do those things you get to a place where that dragon that you have created becomes bigger and stronger than you and it destroys you it wants to destroy you obviously there's grace for you and the word of God is strong and you can come out of that place if you really want to um, but you need to be able to see and to be honest with yourself that you've got a problem in that so practically you must control what goes into your mind and this is this is tough people so especially in the beginning it says there um, in Matthew 5 28 to 30 it says but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body is thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one member of your body than the whole body going to hell. Now, okay, Jesus is not into mutilation, people. You know, this is why he's told the story. He doesn't want you to mutilate yourself and say, okay, look, my arm is off, my eyes out. That's not the point. The point is, when th something that is causing you to sin, when that thing is in your life, you need to be drastic with that. If you're not drastic with it, you're not going to win. So Jesus says, be drastic with those things that causes you to sin. Now, um, you know, there's a, 
a couple of things that, that I just want to state regarding pornography and erotic novels and things um, that, that, that we, you know, tend to do. But what happens through that is it significantly reduces your passion for true intimacy and sex. You know, most people that have become so, you know, enslaved to pornography um, and self-gratification, they come to a place where they're not really interested in, you know, real real life because that's difficult that's messy sometimes because now there's a person actually it's not just an object now it's a person and you need to relate to the person not just for what you can get out of that but it's a relational thing and this is what pornography does it takes you away from that relational through connection then you know porn addiction is cor correlated with an increased um incidences of depression infidelity divorce and financial difficulties and job losses Okay? This is fact. Some people get so addicted to porn that they lose their jobs, their wives, their money, their everything. That is what addiction does. And then, you know, when you do fornication outside of marriage, um, then your body makes a commitment whether you want to or not to another person. We call it soul ties. So you are tied to a lot of people when you sleep around. And you need to, give, to bring that to God so that God can heal you. Okay? Anyway, so... There's a lot of things that, that we can speak. This is a lot longer than we have tonight. But I want you guys just to start thinking about this. Because be it the comprehensive sexual education or whatever the media and, and those social media and things that you got, get bombard you with. You as a Christian and I as a Christian, we need to know what the Word of God says. We need to stand in that place where we can say, this is the Word of God. This is what I will do. This is the standard of purity and I will go and pursue God's word and his purity. Why? Because I want to honor him, but also I want to live life to the full. This world lies to you. You know, Satan lies to us. He says it's it's gonna be nice. And yes, for a moment, the fleeting moment, it is nice. You feel fine, but then as time goes by, you see, hey, but this is actually detrimental to my health. Anyway, so I just uh want to finish this uh this evening on uh on a point of just physical thing you know in, in romans 12 verse 1 and 2 paul writes a thing and you know that is the, the 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 basis of most of our psychology but it comes from scripture it says there don't be conformed to this world but be transformed how by the renewing of your mind okay so he says this almost two thousand years ago already and now what people find out only in the last decade in the last um you know century or so is that in our brains, literally, there is neural pathways that become stronger if dopamine, those you know hormones that make you feel you know excited and things, if that gets into your bloodstream and released through that neural pathway, it makes that neural pathway stronger. So your body and your mind and your fleshly desires, I want more of that, man. So then your body makes that connection. That neural pathway stronger. So if you continue to do something that is detrimental to your health, but it brings you a satisfaction, then you will continue in this neural pathway. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, the way that you break that is drastically, like we just read in the other scripture, but also to just come and renew your mind. And that is sometimes a process. You know, we want to pray that God come and do that. And sometimes it happens. But most of the time, it is a process where you when that thing comes, you must take the thought captive, like, like 2 Corinthians 10 says. Take the thought captive and to the obedience of Christ so that that thought doesn't go into that neural pathway. You must break that neural pathway down and you must create a new one. So that is the difficulty with our sinful nature and just because we are creatures of habit. You need to change your habits with what you see and, and take in. So that you be, can become somebody else. Somebody that is, that is there. So you need to, to reboot your brain. Okay. Three ways in how you can do that. And then I'm going to ask you guys some questions. And you can speak about this. I want you to, to um, if you are in a mixed group tonight. You know, where there are uh, guys and girls together. I want you guys to separate. I want the, 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 the guys to go together. And then I want the, the ladies to go together and speak about these things, you know, because um, it's serious. And you can make a joke about it if you want to, but 
This is serious stuff. And I want you guys to become the people that God wants us to become. But for that, we need somebody that is really desperate for God and wanting to change their life. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. You will always get to a place of dying in some sense if you continue with your sin. So three ways how you reboot your brain. You practice intentional thinking. Okay. You know, kind of this, the power of positive thinking. But you need to practice intentional thinking. Not to think about this, but to intentionally think about that. So practice that. That is the one thing that you must do. The second one is to pursue alternative passions. Okay, so if this is the one thing that you've continuously been doing, start to run, you know, or do something else. Get a, a passion or something. You know, if, if, if you've got a passion for painting, then do that. You know, start to create alternative passions and then the last one is to employ the power of repetition it is going to be a continuous thing so you need to repeat that new pathway that you want to create you know so whenever the thought comes if it goes into that place of sexual immorality to take the thought captive and then to intentionally the power of repetition go into a different direction. So what I did, did and used to do when a thought comes, then I said, no, this is not of Christ. I bind the thought in Jesus name. And then I started to pray for somebody else. So then you pray for somebody else. Okay. And then if you start to reinforce that thing, then ultimately, you know, Satan will start to say, no, no, whenever I give him a thought of sexual immorality, then he starts to pray for other people. I don't want that. And he starts to leave you alone. But you also get a new passion and a new thing that you can focus your energy on. So tonight, I know it's a, it's a heavy one, but it's something that we need to speak about. Because your sexual purity, it brings you to a different place with God. Because most of the time when we're in that place of sexual immorality or impurity, then, then we struggle to connect with God. We struggle to have authority with God because we're always in that place of thinking about this nonsense that we've done. To get to a place of sexual just purity, now you are in a place of standing with God and, and being bold before Him because you know that your heart is set on Him and after Him. So tonight I want to give you three questions that you guys can speak about. So here they come. All right, so first question, just think about your family, extended family, or even friends if you can, if you don't want to speak about yourself, but just speak to one another about how do you perceive the destruction that comes through this one sin of sexual immorality. Speak to one another about that. And then, how do you think does that impact your life if you are sexually immoral in any of those ways that we've spoken about tonight? And then the last one is, do you struggle with this sexual immorality? Speak to one another about that and then ask one another and pray for one another. But then also be drastic and say, what are you going to do to get out of this rut that you are stuck in? So speak about those things. I know it's a heavy one for tonight, but the Lord bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful time as you fellowship with one another. <music>